everyone, welcome again to the Badass Podcast, the Batman the Animated Series show podcast where we talk about the Batman the Animated Series. My name is Clay McCormick and with me as always is Sean Murphy. How you doing, Sean? Good, man. I, uh, I'm a big uh, Clock King fan and uh, I forgot that this, uh, this other one came up so quickly, I guess, after the last one. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. I we will have stuff to talk about, I guess. <laughs> and and uh, Scarface already. Yes. Back. Uh, yeah. Surprising. <laughs> yes. A yeah. very short stint in jail, I guess. Yeah, we're we're, t- we're doing two episodes today, as we always do of Batman the Animated Series, and today's episodes are Time Out of Joint and Catwalk. So we'll take a quick break, and then we'll be back with Time Out of Joint. <laughs> Time Out of Joint, story by Alan Burnett, teleplay by Steve Perry, directed by Dan Reba. And in this one, the Clock King returns to continue his vendetta against <laughs> Mayor Hill. This time... About time. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh. This time, the time-obsessed criminal hopes to murder Hill with the help of a stolen invention that allows him to warp time and travel at super speed. Securing another device from its creator... Batman and Robin take on the Clock King in a furious high-speed battle for the mayor's life. Um, why don't you go first? Because I, th- I feel like you might have more to say about this one than I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have always really liked this one. Mm-hmm. Um, the scene, especially when... Uh, so that the device can either slow down whoever's holding it or speed up whoever's holding it mm-hmm. i love this the sequences where the clock king is um his his time is sped up so he's walking faster than anybody can see him mm-hmm. he's sort of just meandering through this frozen world and you know like a guy's coffee cup if you dropped it then it would fall like an eighth of an inch in two hours and he can like knock on a door quickly and then in the real timeline we all hear machine gun sound like stuff right, like that right i love the little setups of him going down the hallway and seeing a woman about to fall and he commits his crime, comes back, and he sees her having fallen and picking up her papers. Stuff like that I always thought was really cool. And then there's a great sequence, I thought, where they're stuck in the Batmobile and 48 hours go by. Um, well, I guess I scientifically I do have a, a problem with that one. <laughs> but as a kid, I loved it. <laughs> yeah, I, the science doesn't make any sense. I was, I was watching yeah. this. I, I mean, I, I love that stuff. And I, 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 I yeah. shut my brain off at a certain point because I was like, I don't know. Yeah. How any of this is supposed to actually work, but I don't think it really matters. He uh, Batman throws out some real interesting, like bunk science, where he's talking about the theory of relativity, and if yeah. something strikes them hard enough because it's moving too fast, it'll cause a nuclear explosion. Bomb. Sure, which is not which is not true, um, because this what you basically have is a high impact gun. It's not. A, I mean, if a car ran into their car stalled i mean unless the car was even if the car was moving the speed of light that's not how nuclear bombs work right I think you you need to smash something that's heavily volatile you can't just smash steel against steel hard enough and have an atomic blo- a bomb unless <laughs> unless the uh the re- there's an atomic re- small atomic reactor inside the batmobile which i mean who knows oh that would have been slightly better yeah. you know there was a line in there where robin's like uh why didn't the car's sensors pick this thing up and Batman goes, oh, he must have just set it a nanosecond out of time. And I thought, you don't need any of this dialogue. Like, right. Batmobile doesn't need to have a... Se- just, who cares? Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you stuck a thing on a car, and now you're in trouble. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, th- you know, I, I liked this one for all the same reasons that you did. I, I think the time stuff is a lot of fun. Um, mm-hmm. But, I, I, like, story-wise, I just thought it was kind of... Eh, I don't know. Because I, I remember mm-hmm. really liking, I think, the first mm-hmm. Clock King episode... And mm-hmm. that one has that big fight scene, like on on the the, the gears yeah. of the clock and stuff, and yeah. it's it's really kind of uh, fantastic. And this one yeah. is a lot more, I guess, it's spectacle. Yeah, I guess like it didn't feel like a good excuse to bring the Clock King back. I guess mm-hmm. um, because his I totally forgot that he had a thing against the mayor until mm-hmm. I read the breakdown. <laughs> And the uh, the main story is is pretty pretty straightforward, where he's trying to kill the mayor, and then they stop him from killing mm-hmm. the mayor. But um, that being said, I do think the the uh, spectacle stuff is a lot of fun. That mm-hmm. <laughs> there was a couple things where I rolled my eyes, like when uh, uh, the clock king's working for this scientist who's created these speed devices, and mm-hmm. he walks in, 
he's he's this guy's butler and he walks <laughs> in and brings him his food or whatever and mm-hmm. the guy's working on two of these devices and the clock king just like pockets one of them and walks away <laughs> <laughs> and the doctor yeah. the doctor doesn't realize at all that he's done it um yeah i mean hiring this guy must have been a pain in the ass because it's like god he's so snippy and he's everything he says is slightly loaded and dripping with irony and it's like ugh, you're the worst assistant ever <laughs> yeah you know and uh, later on in the episode um uh, when when Batman and Robin come to the after they get out of the Batmobile stuck in time mm-hmm. thing, they go to the doctor's l- laboratory and the doctor is also stuck in time. And mm-hmm. uh, Robin says like, "How do we get him out?" And then Batman just says the same way we got ourselves out, and then essentially just hits the off button on yeah. the, on the thing. And yeah. it was you know so it was it was a few like little things where it's like yeah. eh, okay we're we're not really cooking with gas yeah. with this one. But uh, visually, no. I thought it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I think that, that people were so excited on like, how to animate a clock um, being pulled out of existence, basically, in these like mm-hmm. uh, bl- blurry effects that they did. Uh, yeah, it, this one exists just for spectacle. Yeah. Someone probably had a cool idea where you can use time travel. I was like, well, I guess we should use the Clock King, and it's sort of round two. But yeah, it, it doesn't have the, um, the, the emotional angle that the first one has, where... Temple Fugit is just really pissed off that the mayor made him late and he lost his job. And there's sort of, um, you know, there's more of an arc there. Mm. This time he's just himself. I mean, he's just doing the same old bullshit, basically, you know? Yeah, it kind of, it falls into that trap, I think, of um, what we've talked about with uh, Mr. Freeze when we did Heart of Ice, mm. where when you've got yeah. a character that has such a specific focus, once mm. you take him that focus away, what do you mm. really do with the character? And yeah. Yeah. I think I think uh, the the secondary or the or the subsequent appearances of Mister Freeze are a little stronger than this, but you mm-hmm. do have that sort of thing where you bring back the Clock King, and it's like okay, now the Clock King's just a regular villain. He's just mm-hmm. a guy. I guess he's got a thing against the mayor, but that doesn't really make him that special. <laughs> yeah, and if he can slow time, I mean, I'm watching it in the background right now and he can slow time down enough to sneak past the guards and get into his office. If he just, why doesn't he just bring a fucking gun? Right. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. Or just it's... stab him with that fucking cane, like make him really slow. So the stabs are extra stabby and get out of there. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't need to put the bomb there. He can just stop time and walk up to the dude and just stab him in the back. Yeah. It's uh, it's a, yeah, it's a little what. See, what I was hoping, and I was kind of hoping they were. I was, I, I thought they were going to do this, but they didn't. Which and it made. So I thought the, the time displacement stuff was really cool and had a lot of potential, mm-hmm. but I didn't think that they really did enough with it. Because I was mm-hmm. thinking, I loved the Batmobile sequence where the Batmobile gets stuck, mm-hmm. but I was hoping when they got out of the of the being stuck there that they'd be even further into the future so it would be like two or three days i mean it was two Mm -hmm. days but like i guess if not if not further into the future Mm -hmm. just that more had happened while they were stuck there you know what i mean right it's like they were stuck there for two days and temple fugit had gone on a rampage or something or the mayor was already dead i know they're not going to do that on a kid's show but you know what something like that's a good point that's a good point. You know what, too? I mean, imagine if the Batmobile was frozen for twenty four hour, for 48 hours in the middle of, like, Fifth Avenue. Mm-hmm. The amount of people that would be walking up to it and basically seeing a statue of Robin and Batman inside the car, like, frozen. Right. Their faces in fear. I mean, that's basically what that would look like. You imagine people would be taking selfies, like, stamping their balls against the window, <laughs> you know, graffitiing the shit out of it. I mean, it was all blurry, so we really couldn't see that stuff. But mm-hmm. uh, I just imagine, like, what that would do to Batman's reputation if, like, the city really got a good look at him. I mean, there would be newspaper articles. Front oh, page absolutely. is like, yeah. Batman is stuck. Like, no cops are trying to break in. No one knows what to do. Um, they don't tackle any of that stuff, of course, <laughs> because it just you need to explain. You don't want to widen the scope that much because then you're going to need to explain a whole lot. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and I thought that would have been... I, I, maybe that's for a different show or maybe, for, maybe that's for a comic where you get a little bit more into it. But I, I kind of... Yeah. I don't think that it is because I feel like this show has done stuff like that before that uh, stretches to that level of maturity mm-hmm. in handling this stuff. Um, yeah. And, I mean, if that scene took place in the in the woods or some road that no one traveled on very often, then it would make sense. But in the middle of the street while cars are whizzing by, it's just, I don't know. Yeah, it's like it's it's 
that almost becomes its own episode, you know, where Batman, yeah. <laughs> Batman and Robin are stuck there for two days and they, they oh, can't God. figure out what to do. Perfect. That's the perfect bottleneck episode that you get every now yes, and then when yes. they need to see to save money. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> One set, figure out the lighting and roll. You just It's just a shot of a static Batmobile and then they're talking, mm. but you can't see them talking so you don't have to animate their faces. It's just an exterior yeah. <laughs> shot of the Batmobile not doing anything for 25 yeah. minutes. <laughs> Um, um, no, go ahead. Uh, I was going to ask you what you would do to fix this. Um, um, I guess you mentioned a few things already. Yeah, I think I think the main thing is that I would make the time machine stuff more central to the action and to the plot because it's yeah. it's really just a gag, you know. And yeah. to I was trying to think about what I would want to draw. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think I think drawing the time stuff would be kind of cool because it would be interesting to try to try and figure out how to depict that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the one thing I would add is I was I would like to to have seen Temple Fugit end the episode by being stuck in the mm. in time. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it, he is doing yep. whatever, and the machine breaks, so he's stuck mm-hmm. in the slow version where he's just like frozen the whole time. Right, because you know yeah, that then he's it's... stuck like doing something really painful, like he's in the middle of a, a having diarrhea. And yeah, he's stuck there forever. <laughs> <laughs> or well, I mean, you know, it's 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 the it's the kind of the the perfect end for him is someone who is so uh, obsessed oh, with time and controlling time that he's got these machines that now allow him to control time, and then the yeah. machine eventually uh, yeah. backfires on him, and now he's it's sort of like a. Uh, Twilight Zone mm-hmm. kind of ending, like the uh, yeah, time enough at last so. where he's got all the time in the world to read these books, but then his glasses break, that kind of thing. <laughs> right, yeah. It kind of reminds me of the ending of um, the episode where um, uh, it's a Riddler episode and he's hooked into a computer and the program crashes and he's stuck wearing this helmet f- frozen, like a frozen look yeah. on his face, basically. Yeah. It was be that, 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 that kind of thing. Yeah, that kind of thing where it's... You know, the the gimmick that they bring to the table has a little bit more weight to the story than mm-hmm. just being a gimmick, because that's ultimately what it is. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he should be just out to kill the mayor, because he could so easily do that, and he proves it, almost. Yeah. Um, he should be out to ruin his campaign, or make him late, or like a series of time disruptions using this device that, uh, I don't know. Yeah, that justifies why he has to, why he can't just kill the mayor. Like he, I don't think he's the type to want to just murder the mayor and blow someone up. I think he's the type to want to meticulously take his time and torture somebody. You know? Oh, definitely. So the idea the idea of the bomb it was a cool visual, but I just don't see that character using bombs. It's just too easy. You know? Yeah, at least not that directly. You know? Uh, yeah. It's because uh, I remember in the, the the first episode with him. I remember we talked about how he's very the way that they depicted him was very similar to the Riddler where he mm-hmm. had that sort of inflated ego about things and 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 uh mm-hmm. seemed like he was he felt like he was above it all kind of so which is why he was so much more angry when he was slighted the way that he was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel like you lose all of that in this episode. He's just kind mm-hmm. of like an asshole with a grudge. Right. <laughs> and a clock fetish. Yeah. Yeah, he's not that deep anymore. He's very much one note. And you don't even get, like, you get this nice bit at the beginning where he steals this this uh, antique Louis the Sixteenth clock, and then mm-hmm. after he steals it, he throws it in the trash. He was like, yeah. that was just a test to see if this thing worked. And I, mm-hmm. I took the him throwing it in the trash as this sort of idea that he's moved beyond this obsession with time. Yeah, and no. That's he not read something. Into it too much. <laughs> yeah, that I that's not something they ever get into. Like he never has a moment where he talks about that where he's mm-hmm. you know, I I spent my entire life being uh at the mercy of the clock, but now the clock's at the mercy of me or some shit like that. You know, they never get yeah. into that. It's just sort of it's a gimmick for yeah. the sake of a gimmick. Yeah, you're right. They could have um definitely improved that now that you mention it. It would have made it better. Hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, it's too bad. It's I cuz I don't think it's a bad episode. I think it's fine. Yeah, I think there's cool stuff in it. His his character is, I can never be late. I always have to be on schedule. Mm -hmm. If I'm knocked off my schedule, I'm going to get pissed off. And you're right. They took that away from him this time. And they gave him instead this like mechanical gimmick that he didn't even create. Yeah. Um, I don't even know what the scientist added to the story gives you. Right. Why you needed to spend so much time with this guy. 
Uh, I like his character. He's well animated, and I like the voice actor. But I, I don't know. I don't know what that gets you. Like, if the whole point of this is to get into these time gimmicks, I feel like you could have had this, but with some better setup. Right. Yeah. It. It. Uh. It, it kind of the way that they they treated the Clock King in this episode kind of reminded me of. Uh, there's an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer where um, the whole season has been. I have yet to hear you do a, a podcast where you don't mention Buffy. At I some actually, point. I'll be honest with you, I haven't brought Buffy up in a while. That's not true. I did recently. On I was Star listening Trek, to you and um, you on the other podcast, and you you brought it up at least. And you you even said something like, "I hate to keep bringing up Buffy, but yeah, well, you know, Buffy. I actually well, we just had a big a big crossover moment on Enterprise with Buffy, so I had to bring it up then. So oh, okay, that's fair. Um, <laughs> But yeah, there was the there there one of the sixth season of Buffy. There's this big long season long bad guy arc where it's these three uh, really angry nerds who ha- come up with all of these really elaborate plans and and uh, methodology of how they're going to 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 kill Buffy. Mm. And then after Buffy stops them at the la- the uh, about at about the halfway point or maybe the three quarter uh, mark of the season. Uh, the the main bad guy just shows up at her house with a gun and just starts shooting people, mm. and it's really it feels really out of character for the show because that's mm. that's like you know you said well why doesn't he just have a gun it's like well that's because it's not really that kind of show you know it's yeah. these guys all have these gimmicks and they they operate in line with their gimmick so it feels weird to have the clock king just set a bomb to blow somebody up. Right. You know, it's 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 weird. It it doesn't feel like the it feels like they've thrown all of the character out and it's just like, well, now he's just he's just a guy with a grudge and he just wants to kill somebody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I just thought of this, but I thought if I was going to rewrite this, I might have the mayor be he has like surgery and he has a pacemaker. Uh, and Ooh. the clock king wants to fuck with the pacemaker because if you think about a pacemaker, it's very much keeping the heartbeat, yeah. you know, electrical sound, whatever. Like something, there's got to be an idea there at least. Like that way, at least you get the you know, the core of the character. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I like that. That would be interesting. I don't, I, yeah. I don't know how how much further that pushes <laughs> you into made up science, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, and it's also as for believable. A kids show, I'm pretty sure kids don't want to watch a, sh- a cartoon about pacemakers. Yeah, it's as <laughs> believable as anything else they do in the show, I guess. But, um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, for like, I I think <laughs> I think what we're doing is sort of crafting a darker version of this story that would be <laughs> better set in a comic. And I think that would yeah. that's really interesting having him uh, use this thing to fuck with the mayor's pacemaker. That's interesting. <laughs> See, because that's the thing. That's what I'm talking about, right? You've got the Clock yeah. King. There's so many more interesting time-based things that you can do with him that mm-hmm. are more honest to the setup of this character instead mm-hmm. of just he's got this unbelievable power where he can stop and manipulate time and all he's going to do is blow the mayor up yeah yeah it's a little weird yeah it's definitely yeah what did you think of batman running with the bomb at the end thought, How it just, yeah just I, running over the water <laughs> i thought that was uh i wasn't really sure where that came from and i i also i also really enjoyed as he's running the bomb is starting to slowly explode in his hands <laughs> yeah so and I, I was trying to figure out how that would work of like if you are working at a slower pace than time and this mm-hmm. thing starts exploding in your hands. Does that save your hands from being blown off? I well, I, I, would, I couldn't I couldn't track was, that. Yeah. Plus, they were in slow mo world, mm-hmm. and Batman takes off like a bullet. So that means he has a time device on his belt, changing his time from the time that Robin is standing at. And then the bomb is exploding slower, so that means there's a second device on the bomb itself. Well, he, I think he actually puts one on it, which okay, didn't so make any, s- which didn't make any sense to me, because it was like, well, the bomb is in real time. Why would yeah. you need to slow the bomb down? Oh, because see, you yeah. are already in real in slow time. So if yeah. you're handling something that's in the real world. Right. Then uh, you know, I, I don't know. I I couldn't. It, it was it was. That's what I'm talking about. Where when it comes down to like, I wish this technology had more weight to it. Because if you're mm-hmm. getting to the point where everybody just like they're just tossing out these time stopping machines at the end of the episode, mm-hmm. it's like, well, what's the? None of this has any weight to it. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, oh, man, you made this. Uh, you ruined this episode for me. You're totally right. <laughs> I no, really, I guess I just liked it for three scenes. See, where the the time effects were really neat. Yeah, that's the thing. Like it's it's <laughs> it's it's fine. It's I I would say it's a solid episode of Batman, if a little yeah. unremarkable. But I think the best part about yeah. it is definitely that that time stuff, and the yeah. uh, the way that they animate that and everything. Right. You know, I don't love the title "Time Out of Joint." I yeah. don't like the use of the word joint. I don't know what else I'd put there, but time out of phase. I don't know. This has got to be a better title than that. Time out of whack. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's that title. <laughs> or out. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's. I think, I feel like they could have had like a, a lunch, a lunchtime uh, pun workup mm-hmm. when they were working on the title for this one. But Right, yeah. Or Batman in the case of the slowly exploding bomb. Yeah, there you go. That rolls off the tongue. <laughs> Uh, what, what would you draw on this one? Um, I think I would like to take a stab at some of the time effects because I think mm-hmm. that's really difficult to do in a comic book because yeah. it's how do you how do you depict someone moving faster or slower than everything around it if it's a static medium? You know, I guess you can't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With, you got the Flash. And right. all you do is you you draw him running, and then you draw a bunch of speed lines on him. But that but if it's like someone you doing have to yeah, comic. if it's someone doing day to day motions just by like moving around, yeah. it's a lot harder to depict. So I I haven't seen this Flash episode or series, but I guess when he runs, it's just a guy running really fast, and everything around him is essentially frozen. Which show is that? Which movie? Uh, the Flash, the TV show. I don't know. It's one of the Flash depictions, and they don't do any crazy effects. Or there's at least one scene where they show him jogging. Now he's going the speed of light, or whatever, mm-hmm. and everyone else around him is basically frozen. Like it's him jogging amongst statues. Yeah, I think they, they, I've seen them do that at a few places. They actually did that uh, to pretty good effect. I thought one of the better moments of um, the Justice League yeah. movie was yes. uh, it was the point of view of the Flash as they're fighting Superman. And yeah. everybody's frozen, and the Flash is kind of zipping around, and then you see Superman's right. eye just click over to clock where the Flash is, and the Flash kind of uh-huh. just goes, <gasps> like he wasn't expecting <laughs> Superman to be able to do that. That was one of the better like, moments, you, you, I think. You could not do that in a comic, because you would draw the Flash jogging at normal speed, and then you would draw people as statues, but in comics, people look like statues anyway. Right. And, you know, so you, you totally couldn't get away with that. You, you have to add speed lines or electricity or whatever the hell. Yeah. Or you... Comics. You'd have to, or you'd have to get more like abstract with it, or something. Yeah. Um, there's a I, when I was in college, my uh, sequential art teacher uh, told us about. Uh, I forget who did the storyboards or or how he saw them, but um, oh, I think it was it was a a um, project for one of the classes. Was they had a piece of script from Kevin Smith's uh, Superman Lives script mm-hmm. that never got made. Yeah. And so the project was to to storyboard out a scene, um, and this scene was Superman leaving Lois Lane to go turn into Superman in the blink of an eye, and mm-hmm. he was telling us the way that this one student did it was he kept he was constantly cutting back and forth between a close up of Lois's eyes literally slowly blinking while mm-hmm. Superman was taking his shirt off and, like, flying out the, the window and stuff. <laughs> and it was, uh, it, now that I say it out loud, it doesn't sound as good as it did when he told me it. But, <laughs> but it's like, that's the kind of stuff I think you'd have to do in a comic, where you'd yeah. have to give some yeah. sort of more abstract, arty kind yeah. of uh, illustration. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, even if you tried to show a, a fan, a, table, a, de- a desktop fan blowing wind, like, the blade is spinning very slowly, you could not do that in a comic. Like right. You tried to use moment to moment storytelling but you know the limitations of the medium just wouldn't allow it um but i thought for myself i'm like well you know the obvious thing i'd like to draw is batman on the motorcycles going super speed mm-hmm. but how do i draw i mean i already draw speed lines right and they look like they're going quick wicked fast like how do i make it go supersonic it's just yeah <laughs> you could do something like um i guess it would depend on the scene but let's say you have like a character in a room who's moving faster than everybody else in the room right you could always do like a wide shot of the room and then mm-hmm. do that kind of thing where you're you're drawing the the fast moving character That's in true. multiple places where everybody stat, else is yeah. yeah yeah copy and paste the back oh so or you have a drive by the airplane and you keep the background the same and it outpaces the airplane so for panel one it's on the left side 
panel two, it's in the middle. Panel three, it's on the right, mm-hmm. passing the airplane. Like you could do stuff like that. Sure. Um, I'm not sure that's a very interesting camera. Setup, right. But yeah. it, is, it is crystal clear. That's the thing. It's like, how do you make that dynamic? You know? No. Yeah. You, you can do that like three panels, but then panel four better be you know, like a worm's eye view of Batman hauling ass right. in the countryside or something. <laughs> if you want to sell that page, you can't just do a stat shot of you know trees and an airplane. Yeah. Because it's like it's it's really interesting. Because like let's if if you drew a picture of the Batmobile, like a, mm-hmm. a, a solid in shot in camera picture of the Batmobile, and then people standing mm-hmm. on either side of it. Unless yeah. you add some sort of speed line to that, it's going to look like it's standing still anyway. Yeah. You know, um, I uh, my wife just wrote this Harley Quinn book for Mateo, and um, there's a scene where you have three panels, and the background, so you have Neo, Neo Joker in it with a knife up to one of the hyena's throats. Oh, cool. She's threatening to kill one of the dogs. Mm-hmm. She's on the left side of the panel. Harley's on the right. And this they basically have a standoff, and they each just drop their weapons basically so the dog wanders back over to harley quinn on the right side of the panel and mateo did it by you know he loves wide screen panoramic panels mm-hmm. and it's almost like the camera is on the ground so the the the, peop- the characters are standing on the line of the panel so to speak sure um in the background it's just static just cut and paste 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 and he does move around harley and he does move around neo and one of the dogs and it's a really cool effect i, I really do enjoy it but it is comics trying to be animation, you know? Mm, yeah. But it, it, it works. The way Mateo did it, you could almost feel Harley's, how animated she was as her body position changed while the background stayed consistent. Mm. And you could see the dog running back to safety over across the... I mean, it's just, it kind of works. And uh, I don't like it when comics try to be animation, but there are times when it works, and Mateo definitely pulled it off. Mm. And, you know, uh, you got, none of you can appreciate that because the comic won't be out for like four <laughs> months. <laughs> I, I do think it all de- also depends on how you write it, too. Because, um, yeah. uh, you know, I think the way to, that you can do that that is very native to comics is to cover yeah. a lot of that in um, narrative captions. Like, yeah. say you're getting, if you're doing a first person narration or something, you mm-hmm. can have the internal monologue talk about. <laughs> how much faster you're every everything mo- everything around me moves at the uh, incredibly yeah. slow while I'm the fastest thing on, on earth and all you have yeah. to draw there is like a guy looking at somebody you know what I mean it's like you can you can cover yeah. a lot of that quote-unquote movement in your in your words if you really want to yeah you know an interesting um uh hiccup that I encountered working with Mateo and this doesn't really have much about to talk to deal with this episode but I think people might find it interesting is he, uh, you know when you have word balloons, you have two characters talking. You have person A and person B. And I write a lot of scripts where it's like A says something, B says something, then A says something again. Mm-hmm. So you have to give yourself a lot of headspace. So the balloons and the tails and everything will work if you draw the A person on the left and the B person on the right. Mm-hmm. Um, Mateo loves panoramic uh, shots. He likes to go widescreen movie vision, sure, which is great. But it usually means the characters are their heads are going to be closer to the top of the panel, which means you're going to have less room for dialogue. Uh, the dialogue is going to be to the side of them. So when you have character A speak for the second time, you might have to have that balloon over on the other side of the panel. Yeah, if that makes sense. There's a huge tail. So on it. Yeah. yeah. So he wrote to me. He's like, "Can you not do A B A B?" And I, my first thought was, dude, like, I'm an artist. I can do ABAB. <laughs> I do ABAB all the time in Batman. I, I don't make every goddamn panel panoramic because I understand sometimes you have dialogue that's ABAB, you know? <laughs> and by the way, every time you, if you are, are always using panoramic panels, it just doesn't have that movie effect anymore, you right, know? Right, right. Um, and uh, I didn't say that because I value Mateo and he's got his way of doing things. And instead of saying that to him, I, I said, I'll, I'll try better or... I should say, my wife said I'll, she'll try better to do that, to not do that in the future. Yeah, so, blame your wife. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, she, he would rather have eight panels per page instead of six if he can do his panoramic thing mm. and we spread out the dialogue. Like, he would just, he just, his design sense goes to widescreen all the time. Sure. Which limits call my, my wife's abilities as a writer because she can't do A, B, A, B. She can just do A, B, and that's it. Well, you know? so my, well, first of all, you didn't say it to him, but hopefully he doesn't listen to the show because you've said it now. <laughs> um, but my, my first instinct there is I feel like I would probably, I, I would probably work around 
the script. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to do something like that, I would add a panel if I needed to. You know what I mean? Right. Like if you need to drop in a close up of someone <laughs> so you can cover that last dialogue balloon or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, he's he's obviously knows what he's doing. So <laughs> well, that's that's the thing. And I'm like, how come I've never heard this, Mateo? I mean, you've right. been doing this for 15 years. You've never ha had to deal with A, B, A, B before. I mean, how is this possible? Mm -hmm. I mean, you did 40 issues of Black Science with Remender. And I know he's a dialogue heavy writer with, you know, inner monologues. And that shit's like A, B, A, C, A, D, 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 B, 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 B. And now panel two, you know, so I don't know how uh, I never caught this about Mateo's work. Um because it seemed like something a rookie would say. But I know Mateo is not a rookie. Yeah. So I bit my tongue and I'm like, well, I, I want to make his job easier. So I told Colleen, if he's happy with eight panels, then give him eight panels. If he really wants to do panoramic, fine. But I, I also feel like, you know, if if I wrote the script for you, Clay, and you said, well, can you, can you not do that? I'd say, how about you draw the script that I fucking gave you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would just put my foot down. <laughs> right, right. But I don't want to do that, you know? <laughs> nice to know where I fall in the pecking order here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I let Mateo get away with it. You're you're still, no, I don't know about you that's just fair. yet. That's fair. <laughs> I have no problem with that. Uh, but no, but I mean, if see, I that's... If I you a White Knight book, can you, can you please bite your tongue, Clay, and just do the goddamn <laughs> ABAB and not give a shit about it? Yeah, I, you. you know, I, I do think... <laughs> it's funny, because the, the, the writing that I'm doing now from, from my book, Bloody Hell, I'm uh -huh. finding it interesting because uh, I, I'm, I'm into the, the third issue of it, and um, it's, it ended up being a lot uh, fuller than I mm. expected because um, one of the things that I learned while or am learning during this process is being aware of how much time you have to do all the things you want to do. So mm -hmm. uh, page time, I mean. So I'm into the third issue, and the third issue is pretty pretty dense as far as stuff going on because I've only mm -hmm. got four issues, and I'm trying. And the story that I'm trying to tell is probably a little bit too big for four issues. Um, yeah. And so I'm yeah. I'm going through my script, and it's uh, the editor actually pointed this out to me where it's a, it's the pa the panel count is really similar, so it's mm -hmm. a lot of um, it's like I would say like probably eighty to ninety percent five and six panel pages, and mm -hmm. which can get you know as a reader you can get kind of tired of looking at the same panel count. Yeah. It's all about composition yep. and stuff. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm allowed to do, obviously, because I also wrote it, is I can kind of. <laughs> edit on the fly as far as how I'm depicting yeah. things. So I can do, yeah. um, <clears throat> if I've got five panels, if I feel like, oh, I don't, I wrote an extra movement in there we don't really need, I can drop that and I can do that in one panel here. That'll save me a panel. Or uh, yeah. I actually did it the other yeah. way, yet the other day, where I was laying something out and I was like, well, I actually really like the way this is laid out, but I feel like it's missing a movement. So I added a mm -hmm. panel in, just a small panel of just like a head movement kind of thing, just to kind of yeah. make the flow work a little bit better. So it's... Yeah, it's yeah. having a little bit of leeway there is actually kind of nice. You know, this is the kind of stuff that artists can do when they write their own shit. And I, it's hard to explain to, to people, but yeah, I don't think, and I've said this in other ways before, I don't think you have to be as an amazing writer as someone like Scott Snyder is. I think that what I lack and what maybe what you lack compared to what Scott can do, we can make up for mm -hmm. by tweaking scripts on the fly by adding panels moving dialogue and doing because normally you know scott gets the art and it's 90 percent what he wanted but there's inevitably there's some stuff that wasn't didn't quite land or mm -hmm. he didn't see it that way mm -hmm. so he has to change things and when you hand off the baton like that then there's always going to be a few things that slip through right when you are the writer and the artist nothing slips through in fact you can enhance it every second along the way you know like when i'm drawing uh, plot holes I have the script open and I'm making dialogue changes while I'm drawing, I'm waiting right. for the ink to dry, and I'm moving dialogue into panel three and four, whatever. Um, so I can make these constant adjustments and just wrench it into a better product. And Scott can't do that because he's not the artist. And I don't know how to like, um, how to how to put a number on that. Like, what percentage do writers lose by not writing their own by not drawing their own comics? Mm -hmm. Versus what kind of gain do you and I have? You know, like I want to put numbers on it and I want, I'd love to be able to say like it's 60% it's sixty more efficient if you write your own scripts or whatever, but I know there's no way to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think because I, I, uh, I do wonder on, on, on one hand if it's, uh, if the downside to it is that it makes me um, 
not not have to pay attention less to the to the structure of my script but Mm -hmm. it's like if if it's that malleable when i'm when i'm putting it down on on the page then Mm -hmm. if i'm writing for somebody else am is the stuff that i'm giving them not the best that i could be giving them because it's not going through that round of me looking at it visually and going okay we don't need this we don't need this we can cut this down we can add these together you know what i mean yeah i almost feel like maybe the way to approach it is i'll write you a script that's 80 percent of the way there Mm -hmm. you draw it i'll see where it where where it lands and i'll decide okay so this scene did work this other scene did not right and now i can tighten up the script depending on what you pulled off and what you might have missed. Sure, sure. Yeah. You know, because if you write a script that you think is absolutely perfect and it, nothing can be changed, every word has to go there, um, and then the artist gives you art back that doesn't quite match, then you have to give up. You have to change your baby. Right. Sorry. Right. You know. Yeah. So why why polish it up so much at the beginning? Why not Why not do eighty percent of it as long as he has enough to work with, and then finish it up at the end? Right. And it's funny because I know Millar uh, doesn't do that at all. He writes the script and it's done. Mm-hmm. And he never goes back. He doesn't want you to add panels. He doesn't want you to take panels away. He doesn't want you to move dialogue. He does not want your suggestions. He's a busy guy. He's doing stuff for Netflix now. And you're being paid very well. And you're welcome. You've gotten the Mark Millar script. So right. don't fuck with it. Just draw what you're told, basically. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you have all kinds of choices and things you can do and embellish in the panels that he gives you. But you can't add panels. That's so interesting um, to me because the guys he's hiring... Guys like yeah. you and Mateo, it's like you, or Raphael Albuquerque, you're you're hiring yeah. those guys because you want them to do what they do. N- sort of, sort of, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> well, so uh, for me, uh, he gave me all uh, four panel pages. So Chrononauts, it was one of my favorite books I ever drew. By the way, it was so up my alley that I, it was great. It was like Bill and Ted meets Top Gun in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had a blast on it, but I could only work with four panels a page. So you inevitably fall into, well, every panel is going to be widescreen. Right, you know? right. It's just, and then when you look at Mark Millar's books, a lot of artists do that same thing. Is you just Because with four panels, only a handful of ways you can lay out four squares. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So in knowing his stuff is meant to be cinematic, ma- sorry, cinemag- cinematic? Yeah, cinematic. <laughs> cinemagical. Then, uh, what's that? Cinemagical. <laughs> Cinemagical, thank yeah. you. Well, the theater I go to is called Cinemagic, oh, so I yeah. and no, they're not a sponsor. <laughs> uh, let's try and get them. I bet we could get them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, though, what drove me nuts was I'm like, really, I can't even add a little panel of like a guy hitting a light switch and then the room lights up. Like, I love those little tiny moments, right, right. those be- those tiny beats in a song, if you will. Yeah. And he did not want any of that. And you know, he allowed me to do it for issue one, and he just wrote me a polite note after. He's like, "That's great, but can you please stop? Just write, <laughs> just draw what I wrote, write what I wrote for you." So I was like, "Okay." <laughs> yeah, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think he wants his comics to be movies. Sure. Whereas when sure. I write comics, I want them to, I want them to succeed because of the medium and do things right. that only comics can do. Right, you know, right. and then the movie people can figure out what to change later. Yeah. You know, I uh, what the when the the original Daredevil movie came out, there was uh, the best I. I bought it on DVD, and the best thing about the DVD is the uh, Daredevil creator interview that they have on the second right. disc where they talk to oh, yeah. Frank Miller, Brian Bendis, mm-hmm. Kevin Smith, all these guys who've been working on Daredevil. And, is this uh, the Ben Affleck movie? Sorry. Yes, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I, I really liked it at the time when it came out, but that faded pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> I never saw it, actually. Yeah, you could probably skip it at this point. Yeah. Uh, but the best part was them talking to to Frank Miller because mm-hmm. uh, he kind of ends his interview with this this sort of thesis statement where he says, I got into comics to make them more like movies. I stay in mm-hmm. comics to make them less like movies. And it's it, it he was talking about how his approach to things had changed because mm-hmm. he was trying to make things a lot more cinematic. And then he realized, well, comics are its own medium. Do stuff that that comics can do that movies can't. And so yes, that's that's where I'm at too. Yeah, yeah. you know that's that's kind of um, uh, a really interesting way to go. Once you uh, if if you, yeah. if you haven't been of that mindset to begin with, once you get there, it's like oh man, there's so many different things I can do. So yeah, well, I don't remember the artist who um, was accused of tracing screenshots of Saving Private Ryan for um, a comic. No, oh, I don't. And uh, if you yeah, if you remember his name, don't don't use it because I'm not <laughs> trying to throw anybody under the bus. Chris Dabari. Um, yeah, <laughs> friend Chris. Um, but well, first of all, it felt stale. 
Second of all, it resulted in this giant Marvel, this, this, it was a Marvel book, and this giant battle was basically like panoramic shot, panoramic shot, panoramic shot. And it's which is like listening to a song where the drum beat never changes. Right. It's always the same right. type of timing. And you know what? That kind of gets boring after a while, which is, which I, I hate Alan Moore nine panel grids. I think it's like totally not using the benefits that comics can give you. It's purposefully putting a middle finger to splash panels, to panels overlapping, mm-hmm. to doing crazy mm-hmm. effects, like all the things that illustrators can do with storytelling. It's totally thumbing its nose at all of that and saying, no, 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 all we need is nine squares and you should just be fucking happy that we gave it to you. Hot takes. So, yeah. Hot takes, yeah. <laughs> so if you're an artist and you draw nine panel grids, I, I do apologize. But I feel like, you know, if you if you really want comics to be like movies, you would just do nine panel grids or four panel Mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. panoramic shots but i feel like comics is illustration you want to draw pages that people want to buy and hang on their wall so you want a big splashy panel of batman and you want a tiny little uh, panel of him grabbing his batarang and then you want a slightly longer panel of him throwing it like that's the stuff that makes comics interesting and if you are always using the same size panels over and over and over i feel like it just deadens everything yeah oh definitely yeah i think so well, with that in mind, Sorry, no, I didn't mean for that to be a rant. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, it's interesting. It's uh, it's always interesting to talk about this stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> with that in mind, what would you draw from this episode? Oh, uh, I think maybe I would draw the sequence of him going into the building. Uh, well, you know, the guards eating a peanut, the peanuts hanging in midair, mm. and the fan is blowing slowly, and the woman on the stairs. I think that would be really cool. Uh, I would have Matt do some cool colors, just like they did. Actually, he's changed the yeah the. Uh, but you know, I don't know if it would translate because, like you said, comic panels are already static, and without the motion of animation, I don't know if that stuff would read. Yeah, I you know I, I think it's I think you could do you know actually, honestly, uh, nine panel grid is where something like this could be where That's it could true. be useful because if you did yeah, nine panels fuck. yeah yeah there you go <laughs> if you did nine panels of this security guard uh throwing a peanut into his mouth and then yeah. that's in the grid and it's the same shot for nine panels and then but everything that's happening behind him is changing then you're yeah. simulating this this time movement you know what you could do is have a whole page uh be the a cross section of the building Mm-hmm. And you start the page off on the bottom, mm-hmm. and you have him. Each room in the building is a panel, and you have him walking through, going all the way up to the top floor, up the stairs, and you see people. And then in the next page, you have the same background. You have him going down, but now all of the characters have shifted slightly. So the sure. woman has fallen down the stairs. The sure. peanut has hit the floor. Whatever. And either that would be. I don't know if that would work, but it sounds like you it know might be worth trying. <laughs> I I wish I had thought of this before because it might have saved us going. Oh, how do you even do this? There's a <laughs> there's a comic um, by I think Matt Fraction and Chip Zdarsky called Sex Criminals. Oh yeah. And the concept yeah, of the book is these two characters have this power where any time that they get horny, they can stop time, or mm-hmm. or maybe it's after they orgasm. I can't. It's one of those two, and so it's a lot of it takes place in this stopped time area so there's a lot of that stuff so i guess if you if you're listening to this and you got to this point you want to know how to do it go read (laughs) sex criminals because they do it a lot it's a good book that's true yeah actually you know if i reread that right now i might want to go back and edit a lot of the things i just said because i I might be wrong actually (laughs) yeah well you know it's uh, it's one of those things that it's when you when you're talking about illustrating everybody can come at it from a different angle so (laughs) yeah um what would you give this one for a rating (sighs) You know, honestly, I kind of want to give it a two. Yeah. Um, I think I think I'm gonna stick to. I, yeah, I think I'm gonna give it a two because I I like yeah. the the time stuff, but other than that, I find it to be pretty forgettable. Yeah, I'm gonna go three. Uh, and at the beginning of recording this, I would, thought I was gonna go to a four. Oh wow! But you just knocked you knocked me down. I know. I give out a lot of fours, and uh, I really should stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, just be be honest with what you think. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, yeah, the, the the writing wasn't really there, but the visual spectacle was so good that I think it deserves a th- at least a three. Mm. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, definitely. But I don't, dis- I really don't disagree with, with anything you said. Mm. Mm. That's good, because I can always find a new co-host. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we'll take a quick break, and then we'll be back with Catwalk.
All right, Catwalk, written by Paul Dini, directed by Boyd Kirkland. And in this one, anxious to take up her old ways as Catwoman, Selena Kyle joins forces with the ventriloquist to humiliate socialite Veronica Vreeland. But the real victim is Catwoman herself, who has been secretly set up by Scarface to take the fall for another robbery. Batman has to intercede before the furious feline makes things worse by killing the double-talking ventriloquist. This mm. is uh, a really random pairing of villains, huh? Yeah. Like uh, I go ahead. Sorry. No, I was <laughs> just gonna say we like what you, you mentioned earlier. We saw, we saw Scarface for the first time like two or three episodes ago, and uh, yeah, he's already and I back. Just listened, and kind of. We just li- we just released that uh, podcast like a few days ago. Right, so I was right. listening to us talk about Scarface literally two days ago, and now he's back out of jail and all that. <laughs> yeah, and it's not really. Uh, it's a much like the Clock King, um, but I would say more successfully. It's. Uh, it's not really like a, it's, he's got a gimmick based crime, but it's not his gimmick. You know, Mm -hmm. like he's, he's, he's strong enough of a character that you can just use him and it's fun and it's and whatever, but it's, he's stealing these birds or these, uh, extinct animal, uh, taxidermied animals so he can sell them to like the penguin. It's just, it's just a really random assortment of stuff going on in this episode. Yeah, I that the opening scene is a very it's a flashback of Selena remembering how the good times remembering all the good times where she was Catwoman running around the city mm-hmm. stealing loot all that stuff mm-hmm. and it's done with this like hazy 1980s uh, lens filter to make it more like smoky and romantic I guess mm-hmm. and she has a voiceover talking about how she misses being Catwoman and I don't know why this is in here I don't know why this wasn't cut out like, right. why do we need to know this information we all know who Catwoman is at this point. Yeah, and it's it's like, and that plus the thing at the end where they do that shot of her up on the building, and she says, "I am truly the cat who walks alone," or something. I think it's a right Kip, like, Kipling is, reference can, or whatever. But yeah, like it, oh, is that what it is? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a reference to. Uh, Selena refers to herself as the cat who walked by herself. This is a reference to the cat that walked by himself from Rudyard Kipling's Just So Stories. Why does that? Uh, why is that Easter egg there? I don't why know. Because I don't get like that. the stuff that I. It's this, this is a weird episode because I, I, I love Scarface, so I find him entertaining no matter when he shows up. But this mm-hmm. really feels like it should be more of a Catwoman and Batman episode. Yeah, and because I like that stuff a lot. Like when because yeah. I really like how Catwoman is sort of a blind spot for Batman. So. Mm-hmm. When he shows up at her place, she's like, oh, no, it wasn't me. I was just there to, to see what happened. And he's kind of like, OK, mm-hmm. all right, well, let's OK, let's go talk to them. Like he, he doesn't 100 percent believe her, but he's wants to give her yeah. the benefit of the doubt. And then at the end, when she uh, absconds away after he finds out what actually happened, he actually mm-hmm. has this really pained look on his face like he's upset about it. Mm-hmm. And they yeah, just and then they just cut. Yeah. And then they they just don't really. It seems to be a story about how Selena is by herself and she's always going to be by herself. And it's just mm-hmm. they don't really lean into that. It's just sort of like a, a dressing for this Scarface story. Yeah, there's like three, at least three things trying to compete at once. Like you have this weird flashback opening, which is like, OK, that's cool. Like if that was a, a flashback in a comic, it'd be fun to draw. But I don't mm-hmm. see what this does for the story. And then you've got the um, her talking about extinction with these animals and she feels like she's extinct because her you know she can't she's not allowed to be a cat woman anymore and then you have scarface which is such a weird i mean his tone is so different than her tone right you've got this like goofy uh puppet even she's in the back of a limo talking to him and she's even mimicking him like what's the gag like she does that to her voice and that's just not in catwoman's character and I, uh, I just don't see why he has to be in the episode at all. I think you're right. She should have just decided that she was bored and wanted to get back into it. And you don't need Scarface. Yeah, and it's even... <laughs> I do I do appreciate, though, that everyone who comes in, in... In the universe of Batman the Animated Series, everyone who comes in contact with Scarface, is, their reaction is, okay, so I, this is happening, I guess. <laughs> you know, because she gets into the car. and he, Yeah, like you said, even she she's like, yeah. okay, uh, puppet. Yeah. Great. You know, I would have made it, um, instead of having it be Scarface, I would have gone with Red Claw. Sure. Hired yeah. her. As much as uh, I don't really have, care you know, for that character, why not? 
like a woman hiring another woman. You can have the whole like, you know, girl power thing. Like we don't need men to whatever. Tell us what to do. And uh, she needs something stolen. And Catwoman's like the best thief that she knows. And she thinks that there's mutual interest there. And Catwoman wants to do something for, you know, the jungle cats or preservation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. I mean, wasn't there... Wait, wasn't there? Was that a Red Claw episode already, that, where she fought against Catwoman? That might have been the first, the Red Claw episode. Yeah, I don't, oh, I don't remember. Right, never, sorry. Well, <clears throat> well, I guess this would be like this, the follow up where they decide to team up. <laughs> yeah, I get. You know, I guess, I guess my thought is the way that they set it up. Mm-hmm. I feel like what you should have more of is Catwoman kind of being pulled in both directions. Mm-hmm. So you've got the Batman direction where he wants her to go straight and then you've got the Catwoman direction where she wants to get back at Veronica Vreeland for something her ancestors did or whatever. Mm-hmm. And th- that sort of like conflict where I think that's kind of what they're going for is that ultimately yeah. she doesn't have she doesn't belong anywhere. She's just kind of caught yeah. in the middle of this crazy stuff yeah. going on. But I feel like you just it, all that stuff just gets lost by how mm-hmm over-the-top Scarface is and mm-hmm. how little Batman's actually in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what else to really say about this one. Yeah. I just didn't, I really didn't enjoy it that much. Yeah, it's, I, uh, I was... No, wait, sorry, oh, why, yeah. why did uh, Scarface turn her in? Like, what does he get out of getting her caught? I think he was I think it was just supposed to be like a diversion like she was going to get caught for stealing whatever mm-hmm. and then he was going to get away with the merchandise kind of thing. I, I think. Why couldn't he just get it himself though? I I don't know. Yeah, cuz I mean he set up this to be like his, a, uh, a mastermind. His his crew that he hangs around with aren't exactly nimble um no. nimble thieves. What a guy named Rhino is not nimble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can I can understand like all right, he needs someone who is good at this stuff to go in there and get this thing for him and then you know once he gets <laughs> once he gets the uh once he gets the whip he's gonna take the whip and leave you know mm-hmm. uh, or the idol or whatever it is from Raiders Lost yeah Time. yeah the MacGuffin yeah. I don't yeah sorry I'm, I'm sort of looking over it in the background trying to think about anything else oh well what did you think about the saw ending where uh you have these saws all around again and he's on a conveyor belt <laughs> super random like I, why does <laughs> why are they in a logging mill at the end you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just it's just a really random assortment of stuff it's like they had it's like they had a bag full of stuff left over from the rest of the season and they had to make sure they used it all so paul dini just yeah. got the bowl full of crap yeah. that they didn't use yet and i don't mean crap you know, negatively because i do think it's it's a fine episode but it's just it's right. it's a really random random assortment i mean if you're going to steal something from a, museums are not banks uh if you have a gallery of paintings that are worth millions that's different mm-hmm. if you've got rare gems or whatever of course that's different but when you have uh, like stuffed dead animals like uh you know a tasmanian tiger and it's just the last one mm-hmm. and this thing's behind in the national like that's not necessarily the hardest thing to steal like who the fuck <laughs> wants that and uh if he's gonna take the trouble to go and break into a museum and take something valuable i just don't think that would be the most valuable thing you know yeah, like the cops would show up and like well, he stole what, like a, a dusty Tasmanian devil from blah, like the last one in existence. Like that's unfortunate, but who's gonna buy that? Yeah, that's, there are jewels I, right next to it. I, Why didn't you steal those? I do kind of appreciate the um, twisted like get rich scheme through the lens of a Batman villain kind of idea that that mm-hmm. sort of is where it's like it's like when you have a family member tell you what the new thing he's into and it's and it's like no see what i do is i buy multiple (laughs) boats and then i sell one of them and i light the other two on fire so then the first one that i sell it's that much more it's worth that much more money like it's like okay i think you're overthinking this a little bit but it has that kind of feel to it where it's like no i'm not going to get the jewels i'm going to get the uh extinct taxidermy Mm -hmm. things which i'm going to sell to collectors which is a that's very so it's a very finite resource I'm I mean, tapping into that's like, here. <laughs> that's like somebody buying all of your bloody hell art, burning ninety percent of it, or burning all of it except for one page, yeah. and then deciding that that page is going to be priceless. That's my plan, <laughs> man. If I can't sell any, I've got a lot of pages from a lot of books that I've drawn that I can't move. So I'm just going to start yeah. burning them, and then eventually, because of scarcity, yeah. that means the ones that are left will be worth money. <laughs> 
You know, um, a few years ago, and I'm going to smash my hand that? so I can't draw anymore. So then, that's it. There'll never be any more. <laughs> Good, solid plan. Yeah. <laughs> um, didn't uh, Ryan Otley burn all of his art a while back and post it online? Oh, I don't know. Um, and uh, yeah, so Ryan Otley is a friend. Uh, he's very nice, cool PC. I mean, I mean not PC. Uh, he's an ex-Mormon, so he's a super nice guy. I don't care what you think about Mormons. You've never met an or- a Mormon that's an asshole, and he's a super nice guy. Um, and he drew um, this image book called Invinci- Incredibles. Wait, Invincible? Invincible. Invincible, yeah. And uh, Spider-Man and all that stuff. And he's an amazing artist, and he's a totally happy, positive not dramatic guy. Every time I see him at a show, I know he's solid conversation. He's super friendly. He's not arrogant. Not he doesn't have any like tortured artist in him at all, which is awesome. I wish more artists were like him, to be honest. And then one day, I think he went on uh, posted something on Twitter, a video of him burning <laughs> a lot of his old pages that he didn't like. He didn't think they were good enough to sell. He didn't like looking at them. And I thought he basically poured gasoline on them, put them in a fire, and lit it. I um, uh, I, I made that... sure I did look this up because I this is a weird story that I didn't want you to tell if it wasn't based in fact. But you are a hundred percent correct. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this, okay, okay. This good. did actually we happen. Have to edit yes. this. And Ryan is not the artist to do that. And a lot of people got like pissed off. I think. Um, and I, you know, for him, he thought, you know, I'm doing well, successful, whatever. Like, I don't care about selling these pages to make money. I think the art's really bad. I'm tired of having it around. I'm just going to get rid of them. And he just thought it'd be fun to like, just burn them. And you know, that way the art that's left is like better because you never get to see Leonardo da Vinci's trash can is like this old expression, right? Right. Like, all the, right. the shitty drawings he did by the Mona Lisa before he pulled off a good one. And uh, he thought, well, there's no point in the world ever seeing these things and I'm not selling them. So I'm just going to burn them. And that was the end of the thought. He wasn't a political statement. He wasn't making a, a comment on the value of art and paper or whatever. Like, he's not that guy. He's just, he did a goofy thing that he thought we would film when he posted it. But people read into it like he was, like this was some performance piece. And it's just not. Um, and yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I was shocked to see him burn those pages, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> I thought maybe there was like a dark, twisted artist inside of him that I never noticed because that would be creepy. <laughs> yeah. I, the the little thing that I'm reading about it is, is saying that, uh, uh, there's a quote from him saying, I remember one time I sold a cover I absolutely hated for 20 bucks. The next week it was up on eBay and sold for 200 uh, Should yeah. I have sold it for more? No, I should have drawn it better in the first place and sold it for more. I. That's fair, sure. Yeah, but also <laughs> sell it for more, man. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. Like, I, well, I don't I know. Mean, I, I guess that's why you, you should leave it to other people to price your work. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I did a cover for... Uh, Batman animated uh Paul Dini wrote it just came out I think a month or two ago Mm -hmm. it's issue two it's um continued animated adventures or whatever and I did a cover with uh Deathstroke and it's my least favorite cover I've done in years Mm -hmm. um I feel like uh the the design in theory made sense and the sketch looked good but it's for me it fell apart around his rib cage because there's a lot of space dedicated to his lats and the muscles there right above the belt. Mm-hmm. And there's just, I don't know. I wish I had just done something different or focused more and didn't rush through whatever it is. And there's elements that I love about that cover, like Batgirl's in it, uh, Robin and Clayface. You know that when Clayface became a little girl, her name was Annie. Yes. Uh, she's in the cover, which she was a huge fan favorite. So there are like things that are happening that I really like, but I remember someone wanted to buy it and you know, our, my prices for covers go between five to $10,000. And you know, the business side of me is like, yeah, sell it and get as much as you can. Mm-hmm. Who cares if you don't like it? Mm-hmm. But morally, I just felt like, I don't like this cover. I don't want this person to overpay. I just feel bad selling them a cover that I'm not happy with. Like, the emotional side of me kicked in, which is very rare, as most of my friends would know. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember giving him a good deal, and I said to him, if anybody asks what you paid, can you please tell them you paid more? Like, don't let them know that you got a deal and he's like why are you giving you know and i don't want to tell him that i don't like this cover because then he's gonna like it less too you know what i mean right right it's like when someone loves your shit don't talk them out of it let them like it you know right so i don't know i had a weird moral dilemma and you know 90 percent of the time i'm pretty stone cold when i sell art but that one was one day where i felt very bad and i I wanted the guy to i maybe i sold it for a normal price but i gave him some free stuff just as a thank you um, but you can't do that without him t- being tipped off to the fact that you don't like this cover. Right, this right. thing that he spent five or ten thousand dollars on, you don't like it. Like that sucks. <laughs> now, how would you how would you feel if if he 
if you did that, you gave them a break on it. Let's say you yeah. usually your covers sell for ten, and you gave it to them for five, and then that following you Monday you 10. see it on eBay for twelve. Um, I would feel a little betrayed. Yeah. Um, but you know the buyers that I have that have that kind of money to spend. Don't flip like sure, that. Sure, sure. Um, if you buy a cover for ten, you're probably going to keep it right, for a while. Right. You're hoping to get your money back one day or make a little profit, whatever it is, you know. So, people who that spend that much aren't usually flippers because that's a lot of money to risk. I mean, if you're going to try to flip art, you should get it at auction for cheap right, and sell right. it, you know, in a month or two. That's what people you don't buy covers, especially direct from the artists when they're at their highest, most expensive. You try to get a good deal at auctions. Right. That's how it works. Well, I know? guess so, just in the- like in theory, then like just. Oh, uh, price aside, let's say you gave <laughs> gave someone a, a deal and then they turned around and they flipped it for twice what you gave it to them for. Uh, I guess I'd feel, I don't know. If I didn't like the cover in the first place, I probably wouldn't care. Mm-hmm. If it was a cover I loved and I felt they were going to buy it and cherish it and then it turned out they didn't really cherish yeah. it for more than a week yeah. before they sold it, that would bum me out. But, you know, when you buy art, that's that's the risk. It's right. part of the fun, yeah. you know, is being able to do whatever you want with it. Um, that's funny. Uh, a friend of mine um, commissions a lot of uh, Hellboy art, mm-hmm. and uh, it's his favorite thing to do: is to find new artists, get good deals, like you know, get people when they're young and hungry, and they do like these killer Hellboy commissions. Um, and he's always got like, at any given time, six that he's waiting for to be mailed back to them. Like all the money he makes, I don't know what chunk goes to Hellboy, but it's quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, and um, you should just start. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> burning them yeah no um he uh so but what he'll do is when he gets one he doesn't like it'll go up on auction like the next month and i always thought what's it like being the artist to see this right you know yeah like dude i just drew you this hellboy and you held on to it for a week and now you're selling on ebay for whatever like that that must bum people out you know yeah it's a weird business man i i haven't i haven't run into that too much because i don't know yeah. people just don't want my stuff i guess but <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they do and that's why they don't sell it um yeah. but it's but <laughs> tell, tell yourself that yeah the, f- <laughs> the few times i have seen that even if it's something that i haven't seen in mm-hmm. five years if it pops up yeah. i'm just like oh yeah why uh, what you don't want this anymore you know the, the the collector part of me is like why would you sell this yeah you know but that's yeah it's, they uh, like it's, the hunt yeah like they do enjoy it, but they enjoy it for a few years, and then they sell it. They're not going to keep it forever like you and I would a uh, Jorge Zafino page. Right, yeah, yeah. It's 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 strange, though, because it's a little bit different than, like, record yeah. co- record collecting or something. Like, if I was <laughs> right. if I was yeah. Peter Frampton, and I was going, going out to, and every time I went to a record store, I saw Frampton Comes Alive for, like, 15 cents now, because they're all over the place. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if that would really hurt me as much as if like oh i sold the masters yeah. the master recording of frampton comes alive to this one guy and then he <laughs> flipped it the next week that would probably hurt a little more <laughs> you know uh i uh this goth girl i dated years ago uh she she dated a friend of mine before that and i dated her after my friend dated her it was not the best situation and he and mm-hmm. i are good now he and i joke around about it neither of us talks to her anymore <laughs> but there was a, a, a weird time he wanted to be in comics it didn't happen uh and he saw me as stealing his girlfriend but i don't think he would steal that way see it that way anymore anyway i had just done batman scarecrow year one and um he was probably very annoyed that i got to do this job that he always wanted to do Mm -hmm. and he was so happy when he saw that it was in the 25 cent bin (laughs) (laughs) and i don't blame him (laughs) yeah that's fair yeah i would probably do the same is it petty sure but yeah (laughs) it's the little victories right but uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't really know what else to say about this this episode. Um, yeah, it's. A, I can't believe it's a Paul Dini episode. Yeah, it's 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 got like a little bit of that flair to it, where I feel like it's it's a little bit uh, more cerebral as far as way, the way he's handling the character. I he mm. it's. But at the same time, it's like this this episode's like pun central between mm, Catwoman yeah. and Scarface. You've got like uh, skin a cat. <laughs> remove a splinter cat got your yeah. tongue it's like every yeah. every little bit that they can get out of it they're going for it's like yeah i guess you gotta have fun but yeah what would you draw i don't know that's the thing uh, this <laughs> is one where i was watching it going like oh, i don't i don't really know it's kind of yeah kind of i noticed that the statue of her dad it looks a little like jebediah springfield it does <laughs> yes it does with the coonskin cap and everything i uh 
I don't know. Maybe it's maybe this is a, a, a cop out because I probably said this in the the last Scarface ep- episode. But I think I would just want to draw Scarface. I really like. Mm. Uh, someone asked me just today who I would cast as Scarface uh, oh. in a in a movie. We just had this discussion. Yeah, yeah you they, said uh, they must have just they must have just listened to the uh, to the episode or yeah. something. Um, yeah. uh, oh, and he he said uh, if you had a woman playing the ventriloquist, who would you cast? And mm. my first instinct was like Marissa Tomei or like Amy Adams, and have it oh, be. Yeah. Have it be sort of like uh, my cousin Vinny kind of situation. So, or like uh, you've got one character who's both Ray Liotta from the Goodfellas mm-hmm. and also Ray Liotta's wife. I yeah. thought that would be kind of a fun contrast, where you've got like this big, uh, big loud New Jersey kind of uh, uh, '80s gangster <laughs> woman and this this puppet that she deals with. Oh yeah, that's good. I'd love to see. Uh, uh, oh, what's her face? She's always winning in Oscars. <laughs> Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep, thank you. <laughs> Meryl Streep is Scarface, a Batman villain. Like, oh my god, that would that'd be, be amazing. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if I what would I I'm saying it would be good. I'm saying it would be impressive. <laughs> what would I draw? I would draw Marissa Tomei as as from my cousin Vinny as the ventriloquist. That's what I would draw. That's that's fair. I would draw the scene from the museum where they're fighting on top of a giant whale. Oh yeah, that's from the cool. ceiling. Yeah. Uh, I have certain buyers that fucking love when i draw whales really any kind of ocean scene yeah it's just weird i don't know what it is is I it sold polar bears is it like a like a sex thing <laughs> um no, i didn't think about that until just now so thank you well you're welcome <laughs> save that one, save that one for later can you not lean into the microphone all creepy when you ask me that by the I'll, way <laughs> i'll do my best <laughs> oh god i can take my headphones off <laughs> um yeah, like so a, I, I have like these a, buyers. It's like a sperm whale. I'm never going to get through this story. <laughs> Sorry, like okay, I'll stop. Go ahead, go ahead. After dark. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so I always sell these pages. Uh, even if Batman's not in them, there's people out there that love whales. And um, to the point where I'll sell a page, and then three people write in and say, hey, if you ever draw another whale on a page again, can you let me know? Because I'd like to buy it. Wow. I don't know what kind of weird oceanographer group I seem to have tapped into, but they all <laughs> seem to love whale pages. <laughs> Hey, why not? <laughs> Same thing with bird people. I drew a uh, bird people. I drew a, a cardinal on a page once, and bird lovers out there also read comics. Mm-hmm. And I had a feeling that someone's going to want this giant splash page of a uh, a cardinal, and uh, it doesn't even work because the charm of a cardinal is it's bright red. So when you buy a black right. and white artist of a bird, it just doesn't read. And I, so I put a six hundred dollar price tag on it, thinking like, I bet some weird bird person is going to want this. And sure <laughs> enough, it was one of the first pages we sold from that issue of, uh, I think it was the Wake. It was probably the penguin just after he got off the phone with Scarface, buying that ind- extinct <laughs> penguin statue or something. <laughs> I don't know, man. I think you should stick with the sperm whale jokes. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, at Badass After Dark, where all the cats are in heat. <laughs> oh my God, do you do that to Caitlin? That's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, um, as far as a rating, I'm gonna go two on this. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm feeling that too. Yeah, I, I yeah. it's another one where it's like I feel like I I feel like there's something in there that they just got obscured by the other stuff they were doing, but I feel that less so than the last one. Yeah, because this one yeah. just seems to be a hodgepodge of stuff. Which I mean, it's fun. It's fine, but you know. Yeah, I used to get mixed up between this one, Cat Scratch Fever. I, I guess the only really good Catwoman episode I like is the first one, which is a two-parter, mm, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a two-parter. Yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised she doesn't... You know, I, I, the one thing that I've I've really noticed uh, so far doing this show is how many of the... How many episodes we've done and how few times we've seen some of these bigger-name characters. Like, mm-hmm. I think we've only seen the Riddler a couple times, and we've only seen Mr. Freeze once. We've seen Clayface mm-hmm. once, I think, if you count just the two-parter. Um, yeah. The ones they keep going back to are the Joker and yeah. uh, Two-Face and Poison Ivy. A lot of Poison Ivy. Yeah. Um, it's so crazy how much of the stage that Mr. Freeze holds. Because mm. he's only in, I think, two episodes. Maybe three. Yeah, I think. If you count a Batman Beyond episode. And he's got the movie, too, or the Sub-Zero movie. Oh, that's right. You know, yeah, he does have a whole movie, which is pretty cool. But still, I mean, it's that's not a, they did. Uh, we are at episode seventy-four 
out of uh, <laughs> over over eighty five episodes. So like eight, almost a hundred episodes. He, he's in three of them, yeah. and he's the thing that everybody uh-huh. talks about when they talk about this show. Yeah. Well, that documentary that you uh, linked me to the other day. Um, f- people listening, there's if you go on YouTube, there's a uh, DC Comics or Warner Media put out like. Uh, a new uh, documentary on Batman the animated series which is worth watching um, we were debating dedicating an episode to it mm-hmm. but I feel like we sort of talked about a lot of the stuff that that are already just throughout our day doing these podcasts yeah, yeah. so I don't, I don't know if we really need to cover it yeah but uh, yeah they talked about Mr. Freeze and that one being basically everybody's episode favorite episode and yeah <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> again it's it's, it's funny amazing. though because like I'm thinking when I think back about this show that I remember from being a kid the stuff that stands out is Mr. Freeze. Oddly enough, the Clock King stands out, but he's only been in two episodes. <laughs> it's not like he was a mainstay of the show yeah. or anything. It's right. uh, yeah, it's it's uh, they've used Killer Croc more times than they've used the Riddler at this point. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. I, you're right. I thought there were more Riddler episodes. And there's two, and they're basically the same episode. Right. right? Yeah, and I think that's it from <laughs> from what I can remember. Uh, one, two. Well, he's in Almost Got Him, but he's not. He doesn't mm-hmm. take place like he's not the uh, the main guy. Uh, no. so counting Almost Got Him. Uh, he's in the background of Trial. Uh, we've got one <laughs> more. I guess yeah, one more, one more Riddler episode. So, f- uh, four episodes that he's like the main villain yeah. of. I have a uh, opening scene in uh, <clears throat> Volume Three of uh, White Knight. It'll be beyond the White Knight, mm-hmm. and I have I have Batman. You know, I have Batman in jail at the be- at the end of Curse. And uh, spoilers: he's probably going to uh, encounter some people in jail mm-hmm. who he's put away. And I'm trying to decide who it should be. And uh, it's just a cameo. And I thought maybe because I've killed most of the characters, <laughs> right? So I don't know. Yeah, I thought maybe a character named Lockup. Who was introduced in the animated series would be cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought maybe uh, Azrael might still be alive, like they cured his cancer, but you didn't like that idea, so I guess that wouldn't work. But I don't know who to use. Yeah, uh, yeah, I I didn't like the Azrael idea because I feel like he's he's so prominent from the second season series that it feels like you're setting up yeah. something that isn't going to pay off if you don't use him no. again. You know. Yeah, you may as well you said, like, hard cut. You, you retired. You retired him pretty well. Just let him right, stay retired. Right. <laughs> but I, you know, it's funny uh, when we were first talking about what you're going to do in Curse of White Knight, and you were looking for a villain to use. I think I recommended I was uh, the Riddler because yeah. you didn't use him, and I didn't remember seeing him in the first volume. But I guess he was one of yeah. the guys who was possessed by uh, yeah, um, he's Clayface. Yeah, but um, he. Uh, yeah, he's, he wasn't that interesting. I didn't get to really write the Riddler. He's just in the book. Yeah, so my my first instinct was, oh, I mean, he's he's a big name character that you haven't really touched on. The Riddler might actually be kind of cool, but uh, yeah. but he might be yeah he might be cool to throw in there in jail. Yeah. Do I have him get stabbed in Curse though? I don't. I don't I remember. Mean, in, in jail, it has to be a guy who's like who has a gang. He's leading a gang basically. So I thought it would be like a big muscly guy, but I guess it could be a, a calculated type of you know. You could use, uh, well, I was gonna say like Calendar Man or something like that 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 you haven't you haven't oh, used at yeah. all. He's kind of fun, but I, yeah, I'm just I guess readers, if you or if you listeners, if you have any ideas of who you'd like to see, like who's White Knight, who's who would be who should be in White Knight that isn't yet, someone that can be like a cameo, could kind of come and go in one scene. It's not someone that you need me to dive do a deep dive into. Yeah. that's not gonna happen. So give me something that you just want to see in one scene. Condiment <laughs> King. Condiment King, yeah, <laughs> or Firefly. Ooh, Firefly. He'd be he'd be a good one. That's true, but I, to do him, if he's going to be in jail, I doubt he's going to have his you know space right, suit, right. and his jets, and all yeah. that. That kind of is what makes him. <laughs> yeah, Clock King. Well, he's not going to run in jail anyway. We won't we won't just spitball ideas. Yeah, we yeah, could do sorry. this. We'll just go down the list of Batman villains. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess that's going to do it for these two. Um, next time we've got a, a big episode because we are doing. Bane and Baby Doll are the next two episodes. Oh boy! And we are going to be joined by another um, donator or donator patron. How would you refer? Uh, supporter? Jackass. Yeah, Jackass. No, uh, another another supporter of my uh, my Bloody Hell Kickstarter is going to be joining us for that one. So uh, th- that'll uh, that'll be fun. Cool. Yeah, that was fun, man. I uh, had to run out early that one time, so I'll make sure I. <laughs> 
stick around and give this person their their money's worth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's fine. He just was bad mouthing you after he left, but it's fine. Um, that's okay. Yeah. So uh, that'll that's gonna do it for us on this episode, and uh, we will see you next time. <laughs> Let me die.